geochemically. Uh, there is, of course, the mid-oceanic ridges where material is melting and uh, forms the magma and the oceanic crust. Uh, at the bottom uh, is this D2 prime, D double prime layer, which is the boundary between the core and the mantle. And we are now uh, learning, again, from seismic uh, tomography and seismic techniques, uh, a lot more about the structure of this D double prime layer. Um, we know that at least some of these slabs which have been subducted make it all the way to the bottom of the mantle. So they lie here at the mantle core boundary. And then uh, there are uh, a lot of models which postulate that there are these sharp upwellings called mantle plumes which make it all the way to the top of the lithosphere where they melt and form magmas. So, and there are these downwelling uh, currents which are localized at the boundaries of the continents. So, yes, it is convection, but it is a very complicated convection in a material that undergoes phase changes. It is layered in its viscosity and so forth and so forth. In the, the past 10 years, there have been very big advances in modeling mental convection. The, the prime place in Germany uh, for this modeling is the University of Munich, where Professor Brumus, a uh, world famous group, is uh, doing a lot of uh, very groundbreaking work. And what models can do now is they can model the whole Earth in three dimensions, they can assign a lot of properties which are physically realistic. Um, but many of these properties that have to be assigned to these models are really not very accurately known. For example, nobody knows what is the viscosity of the lower mantle. We don't have experiments. We don't really have very good ways to estimate it. So what the researchers do is they make parameter studies. They make their convection, they make their whole Earth convection models. And here is an output giving um, the temperature anomalies. So these uh, pictures are similar to the seismic tomography pictures that I've shown you. The blue parts are the cold parts in the mantle, and the yellow are a little warmer, and the red is even hotter, always relative to the standard structure. Okay, so this is the anomalies in temperature. And then the researchers try to adjust the parameters in such a way that they get something which looks like the Earth. And then from that, they try to infer what the right parameters in the mantle should be to get these models. So here are some famous examples. Uh, there is um, today a huge amount of literature about mental convection. And uh, what you should notice here is that the, the structure of these cold and warm um, circulation <coughs> cells in the mantle are different in all these models. And they are different because people have chosen uh, a different viscosity structure, for example. The lower mantle is now a little bit uh, higher viscous than the upper mantle. And then, in the end, the scientists are trying to find the right parameters which give us co convection cells, convection patterns, which resemble what we see in our seismic tomography. So, there has been an enormous advance. But still, mental convection modeling uh, has uh, big, big uh, uh, problems in completely describing what is happening on the Earth. So what mental convection uh, models have not yet been able to make is plates. This outer shell of the Earth, where we have lithosphere, we have volcanism, uh, we have earthquakes, brittle processes, and so forth, and so forth, has never been spontaneously generated 
in mental convection models. They are not rich enough yet. They don't. Um, they are not able to incorporate the uh, the fracturing processes and the localization processes in the lithosphere. So, if you want the holy grail of mental convection modeling, at the moment, is to start a model and then spontaneously generate plates. And that is something that could well come in the next uh, five years or ten years. And uh, if it comes, then you will certainly see it in the front page of Nature, because it will be a very big breakthrough. Okay, so the mantle convex. And we know that on top of the mantle, we have the plates. We have the lithospheric plates. And remember, uh, the lithosphere is not just the crust. It is the crust plus the hard part of the upper mantle. The base of the lithosphere is the 1300 degree isotherm. We have talked about this a couple of times. So, we have the plates, we have the convection cells, and now we can ask ourselves, what drives the plates? What is the main motion behind plate tectonics? What is the main force behind plate tectonics? And that question is not so easily answered. Uh, the plate tectonics uh, scientists have been trying to answer it uh, for many years, and there are some parts of the story on which there is consensus, and other parts in, on which there is still a lot of discussion. Um, of course, the motion in convection cells is the main motor. There is heat coming out of the Earth. There are uh, mid-ocean ridges. There are subduction zones. But it is not as simple as saying that the plates are simply riding on top of the convection currents. Okay? Um, there would be then a, a current like this, and a current like this. And these currents would simply carry the plates. That is not the case because we have at the bottom of the uh, lithosphere the asthenosphere, the low velocity zone, and this asthenosphere is in fact very, very soft. So the plates are able to move quite easily relative to the mantle which is convecting. Okay? If we look at what is actually, uh, what are the forces to drive the motion of a plate, there are a number of important ones. First, there is this force called ridge push. Ridge push arises because the mid-oceanic ridges are actually a little bit higher than the surroundings. Remember, in the middle of the oceans, at the mid-oceanic ridge, there is a mountain chain. And because this crust is higher, it wants to slide down, just like Anything that is higher wants to slide down. And this force is called the ridge push. The ridge wants to move away from each other. And the other very important force is what is called slab pull. Slab pull is the force which is given by the fact that the slab which is subducted is cold and therefore it is dense. Remember, the density increases if the material is cold. And this cold material goes down into the mantle and it, it finds itself relatively cold with respect to the surroundings. And so this subducted slab is actually trying to pull the rest of the slab behind it. Okay, there is a kind of subducted plate hanging on the part which is uh, on the surface and there is a pull of the slab which is trying to pull it down and this ridge push and slab pull have been shown now to be more important forces than the drag along the convection cell plate interface 
So the plates are moving to a certain amount independent of the convection cells. They are, have a certain amount of freedom to do things which are different than the motions of the convection cells. So this is now um, from a different textbook, uh, but from the same chapter, showing that you can decompose this uh, rich push force and then the slap pull force. And here at the bottom, there are the shear forces due to the convection currents in the mantle. And the question is, how do we find out which of these uh, forces, which of these forces are more important than the others? Which are the plate driving forces which are really the key, which drive the plates? And for that, there are some classic studies and there are also a lot of modern studies. And the classic study comes from um, around 75. This is the time when plate tectonics really was a revolution. And uh, what uh, the scientists did at that time is they looked at different parameters for all of the plates that have been recognized. Okay, so this is the Eurasian plate, this is the North American plate, this is the African plate, this is the Indian plate, this is the Arabian plate, and so forth. And then they measured the plate area, the continental area of the plate, and the amount of the circumference of the plate, which is connected to a subduction zone. These three parameters. And they compared it with the velocity of the plate. So these three famous diagrams show you the velocity of the plate compared to the plate area with the idea behind it that if the plates are really stuck to the convection currents, then a big plate would be more glued to a convection current and would be carried along more powerfully and would maybe migrate faster. But in fact, if you compare, there is not really a very good trend that you could find between the velocity and the plate area. But what you do find is that the plates which have a large part connected of along the boundaries to subduction zones, for example the Pacific plate, they all move very fast. So plates which have a large part of their boundaries with a subducted slab pulling on it, they move fast. And plates which don't have a lot of subducting boundaries, they are slow. And this is one of the classic, main classic arguments for saying that the slap pool is the most important plate driving force in plate tectonics. If plates have a continental area which is quite large, then they tend to be slow. And that is related to the thermal structure, maybe these cold continents are better stuck to the underlying mantle. Maybe there is a better coupling between the mantle. And that is another um, argument which is in the classic uh, textbook on plate tectonics. Now, in the modern research, there